Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, we are coming up to the end of the class, to be sure. I just have a few more weeks of new content for you and then we're going to really just focus on reviewing uh, and then doing uh, kind of some wrap-up stuff. So uh, not too much longer to go. You, you all have stuck with it and I think done a, a pretty good job of trying to figure out what's going on here, which is not easy, so I commend you. Uh, so this week, uh, you are going to be looking at participles and infinitives. Now, um, you struggled through the bulk of the difficulty in Greek. Uh, Hebrew is going to be much, much simpler, I promise. Um, maybe not the identification, but, well, Lagos does that for you, right? Um, it's just a matter of figuring out how it functions. So uh, let me just run you quickly through some of the particular nuances that I think you should be aware of. So uh, participles are much different in Hebrew than they are in Greek. They're much more straightforward uh, than they are in Greek, but they are still verbal adjectives. Uh, so that is kind of a, a universal concept that you can put in your back pocket. A participle is a verbal adjective. Um, but uh, in Hebrew, you just need to kind of figure out how to deal with it. The first and most common way that uh, uh participles used in Hebrew is simply as a replacement for the main verb. Um, in this case, it's going to function much like the present continuous did in Greek. Um, so you'll notice the example here, the man is watching the woman. Um, really, the uh, the strict translation would be the man, ha'ish, the watcher, uh, ha'shomer, that's the participle, Et, that's the direct object marker, Haisha, the man, the watcher, the woman. Uh, namely, the man is watching the woman. Uh, and since Lagos tells you that that's a participle, you are free to translate it as a present continuous if you are ever to come upon a simple phrase like that. Um, and it will often function in that way. Very straightforward. The other ways that it's going to function, and this should not surprise you, is the same ways that adjectives function. Um, so it can be attributive, predicate, or substantive. Um, so I give you a few examples here, but if you're familiar with uh, with the way adjectives function, now you're simply dealing with a verbal adjective. So it's not um, fat or skinny or tall uh, or anything like that. Instead, it's uh, riding, jumping, watching, running as an adjective. So the running man is an example of an attributive adjective, but it's a verbal adjective, namely running. So as you look through these, the the English construction should look similar to you, uh, or, or should be familiar to you, I should say. Um, so let me just point out to you some of the nuances in Hebrew of the form um, and how you can kind of discern and maybe create a flow chart for yourself as to how to take these particular participial constructions. So for instance, uh, in the first here, you'll notice that when a, when a participle is functioning attributively, uh, both the noun and the participle are going to agree in gender, number, and definiteness. So if they both have a definite article, there you go. If they both don't, there you go. Uh, they agree. So your possibility is that this is uh, functioning attributively. Um, and if it doesn't work to just translate it as the jumping person or the floating cloud, um, then feel free to add in the word who, the man who is writing, the man who is uh, watching, and so on. Uh, so who is is a common way to allow a verbal uh, adjective to function as an attributive adjective. Uh, the next uh, category is the predicate participle. Here, the participle, or I'm sorry, the noun will be definite and the participle will be indefinite. There you go. Um, so if you have the man and you can see the definite article there and then you have an infinitive right after it, then you know that it's just functioning as the main verb is writing. The man is writing. All right. Um, and then finally, substantive. Uh, if you just have a participle standing all by itself with nothing to modify, then it's probably functioning substantively. So, but it's not going to be guarding or judging. It's going to be the one who judges or 
just the judge if you wanted to to turn it into a pure noun. Um, I'll leave that up to you in your translations, though I want to know that you know it's a participle. Okay, um, and then of course, because it's functioning as a verbal adjective um, and it's sitting in a sentence, it can always happen that it comes in the construct state. Um, that could be demonstrated by, um, I've called it a hyphen, um, it's called a makef in Hebrew if you're interested in the technical term. Um, and simply what that's going to do is tell you to add the word of, just as any construct state does for the nouns. So, the guardian of the covenant the judge of the wicked men. All right. Okay. And then of course, last but not least, uh, it's going to come occasionally with a pronominal suffix. So I'll, I'll reiterate this again, make sure that when you're looking at these words, um, and you right click on them in Logos that you take note of all the pieces that Logos tells you is there. If there's a preposition, if there's a definite article, if it's in the construct state or the absolute state, and then if it has a pronominal suffix, and you should be able to just add those all together. It has a bait preposition, which means by. It has a definite article, which means the. It's the verb shamar, which means to guard. And it has a pronominal suffix, which means you. So uh, by the one who guards you is how you would translate that all together. You just kind of need to add them all up uh, like a big long string of addition. All right. Okay, uh, let's jump into infinitives. So this is where it gets a little more complex, however, not as complex as Greek. So you're still getting off the hook. If you remember things that happen in Greek, you shouldn't have too much trouble with what's going on with infinitives in Hebrew. Now there are two kinds of infinitives and the two categories shouldn't surprise you because these are verbal nouns. Um, and just as nouns can come both in the construct and the absolute, Likewise, also, uh, infinitives come in the construct and the absolute. Now, here's a simple way to remember whether or not you're looking at a construct or an absolute, other than the fact, once again, that Logos will tell you. Uh, if it's a construct, there will be things constructed onto it. That is to say, there will be more than just the root uh, verb. Okay, so if you look it up and it says there's a lamed preposition or a bait preposition or a cough preposition attached to it, it's an infinitive construct because it's something has been constructed upon it. Okay, uh, if it doesn't and it's all by itself, um, then it's an absolute. There you go. Uh, simple Simon, right? Right. Uh, okay, so uh, let's take a look at a few of these. Um, the the most common way you're going to see this is what's very akin to the the standard kind of English version of the infinitive, um, which is going to have a lamed preposition attached to it. Okay, so uh, lamed, remember, means two or four. In this case, probably two and then the verb. So it should be easy to remember to judge, to run, to jump. You're just going to have an infinitive form with the lamed preposition attached to it. Okay. Um, sometimes if it starts off a sentence and context demands it, you can translate it as an English gerund, um, which is an ing verb. Um, so judging, watching, uh, but that's all contextual. You're not I'm probably not going to be able to figure that out just by looking at the word. If I ask you to just look at a word out of context, just tell me what the standard, uh, thing would be to do with it. Uh, like you would say to judge instead of judging and so on. Okay. And then I give you a lot of instructions here on how it can occur with an object, with a subject, with a subject and an object. Um, and essentially what it comes to is that it ends up looking a lot like uh, a finite verb in those contexts. It's just functioning in that way. Okay. Um, and of course, once again, it can come with a suffix because it's just like a noun. Okay. So it can have that uh, pronominal suffix attached to it. Um, and then occasionally it can be preceded by an independent preposition, um, in which case you translate the preposition. Um, and then uh, in this case, you'll notice uh, the suffix functions as uh, the, the subject of it here because they watched sheep. Abraham paid them. So here's what I'll tell you when you come across things like this. Look at it, 
see what you see, namely, okay, I've got an infinitive construct here. Um, it has a pronominal suffix. It's preceded by a preposition. Uh, what am I supposed to do with this? Look at your English translation and see what they do with it, and then see if you can uh, if you can reverse engineer what they've done. That's really the best I can ask you to do at this point. I'm not expecting you to be experts on this, okay? So just do your best with it. Um, and if you have any questions, throw them in the forum. Um, you all have been extremely, extremely good. N not not pandering here. My best class at engaging each other in discussion and answering answering each other's questions. So uh, I really appreciate all that you you all do in that. Okay, so the last bit, and this is the fun part, uh, is the infinitive absolute. The infinitive absolute is weird. Uh, it functions in a way unlike anything else in English, okay? So much like the participle in Greek really doesn't have a, an English correspondent, um, likewise, uh, the infinitive absolute in Hebrew really doesn't have an English correspondent, but you are familiar with it already, you just don't know it yet. Okay, so... Uh, an infinitive absolute uh, can function in a few ways. Um, the first is that it occurs with its cognate verb. Now, what I mean by that is you have a finite form of the verb. So in this case, uh, as I'm showing you here, shamar, and it's uh, preceded by shamor, shamor shamar, watching he watched. Uh, in other words, he really watched. Um, oftentimes in your English translations, you'll see this construction translated as he surely watched. Um, and the one you're probably most familiar with is in Genesis. Um, if you eat of this fruit this day, you will surely die. Um, it literally says dying, you will die. Uh, this is just the way that we make sense of it. We put an adverbial clause in to, to emphasize the verb. That's, uh, so this one's kind of fun. Now you know what's going on behind the scenes, but it's not rocket science to translate. Okay. If you see them and they're right next to each other, uh, then you just add the ver adverb surely or certainly or really, uh, or indeed or something like that. Okay. Um, when the infinitive absolute immediately follows the cognate verb, um, it's expressing duration. So uh, if it's shamar shamor instead of shamor shamar, uh, then you're looking at continuation. So he continually watched. Um, and then sometimes it's used just as a substitute for the infinitive, and you'll know when it's happening because there will be no cognate uh, form. So you won't have a finite version of this verb. You'll just have the infinitive absolute out there all by itself, in which case you just translate it like uh, like a um, an imperative, a command. Do this or do that. All right. So that's that should be pretty simple and fun for you to engage. Uh, I hope this was helpful and uh, look forward to seeing your homework. I formatted it a little bit differently this week, so hopefully it's easier to engage. Um, I think some of you are struggling with a little bit with the format, so uh, let me know. Uh, please feel free to critique uh, the format and let me know how I can make it better for you uh, to engage with. So I look forward to, to seeing your work, and I will see you on the discussion boards.